And we're live. It is Thursday, November 19th, 2020, 5 o'clock p.m. And uh, it is day, I'm not sure what, day like 17 of the ongoing coup attempt. Um, it is the day that the coup attempt reached uh, the truly comic proportions as the president's lawyer blamed uh, for, for fixing the election uh, a dead person named Hugo Chavez. Um, and, and, and like had his uh, hair dyed. That's right. Dyed. And the uh, president's other lawyer had his hair dye running down his cheeks like tears. Um, it's, a, it's a rookie. It's a rookie mistake. So I, I assume you have had experience with hair dye uh, uh, in, in your, and maybe we should talk about when uh, when we get started about hair dye tips for Rudy. But before that, Kate has the monologue today. Um, I hinted at this yesterday as we were wrapping up. Um, so apparently the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree just like comes from like people submit Christmas trees, like including ones that grow in their front yard to like be considered for the Rockefeller Christmas tree. And then they like, monitor them over years and they make a final determination anyways. This year's Rockefeller Center Christmas tree came from Oneonta, New York, which is really not that far away. It's like two and a half hours outside of three hours outside of um, New York City. Um, but by the time that it got to Rockefeller Center, like literally a third of the tree looked like it was missing. It was the most raggedy ass tree. Mangy tree. I mean, mangy it's tree. Yeah, it's a tree was, with mange. I just like don't actually know what happened. Like it's like it's like literally looking at it, you're just kind of like, I like what what happened? Like what could have possibly happened to this tree? Anyways. Um, so there was a bunch of memes going around about how that was like this, like this tree is the, is like all of us, this tree is like, it, like epitomizes 2020. And then further epitomizing the complete, you could not write it if you were a Hollywood script, like, right. Uh, there appeared in the tree to be a tiny owl that had like hidden away in the branches the entire way from Oneonta and it had to be rescued uh, and uh, I suppose is being set free because there's nothing wrong with it besides being traumatized uh, by having its tree cut down. It's like the story of the Lorax or something. I feel like we're in like a Dr. Seuss, uh, a Dr. Seuss book at this point, except much <clears throat> darker. Anyway, so that's, that's the monologue for today. We're not allowed to have fun anymore, but in lieu of fun, we have Alessandra Nivola here. Very nice to meet you, sir. Great to meet you. So what is this, this guy I've met before? Yeah, so let's yeah. let's let's start with Rudy and the hair dye. Uh you know, you've had to do all kinds of costumings. Uh if you had to play the president's lawyer under uh bright lights, you know, uh maybe it'd be hot and you had thinning hair and you were really vain. And so you wanted to uh, uh, make sure you looked, you know, a good three or four years younger than you were. Um, what did Rudy do wrong that somebody in the business would know to have done? Well, first of all, I basically have played Rudy, Rudy Giuliani um, in uh, the David O. Russell movie, American Hustle. Uh, I played, I guess he was the, he was the federal prosecutor for New York. Um, and now I'm forgetting his name. He was based on a real guy who um, <clears throat> had been one of Klaus von Bülow's uh, lawyers. Um, ah, I have his book here too. What is it? Um, Puccio. Puccio. Oh, Michael Puccio. Remember that guy? Yeah. Uh, and in fact, Bob Katzman uh, put me in touch with Bob's brother who knew Puccio. Wait, and that wait, was my the main Second Circuit research. Judge Bob Katzman? Yeah, so here's, yeah, so, so so here's Robert Katzman. Here is some serious ass Brookings gossip. Bob Katzman. Can I, 
Bob I was Cat- going to say something about Bob Katzman's hair, but I will uh, refrain. No, so Bob Katzman, who does have an identical twin, who's a longtime prosecutor in the Boston area, um, Bob Katzman was my predecessor at Brookings. And uh, the when Bob Katzman went on the bench, uh, the head of my section at Brookings had to replace him. And... Uh, uh, that person was uh, one Pietro Nivola, whose uh, son is our guest today. And so I was hired oh. by uh, Sandro's father, Pietro, to replace one Bob Katzman at Brookings. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, really? Oh, oh my God. Amazing. All, all true. true. And Bob Katzman and Pietro were, were uh, the closest of friends. Ha. Yeah. So, so Bob, I grew up with Bob, you know, we, I remember we used to go to Chinese rest, uh, you know, get Chinese food. He was a big Mushu pork fan. And, uh, when I was a little kid and we've stayed close ever since. And so when it came to playing <clears throat> federal prosecutor, he was the logical guy for me to go to, to, um, get help. And so he sent me straight to his identical twin brother who had, uh, worked with Puccio before and, uh, I got the download from him. So when I, so initially to play the role, I was trying to look as much like him as I could. And he really doesn't look like me very much. And so they started out with this look. That That's me. Wow. Uh, that was, the, that was my first hair and makeup test for that, um, for that role. And, Awesome. Um, it looks quite a lot like Giuliani, I'd say, too. Uh, <laughs> Except for the and, part that it's not running down your face. Well, oh, my not God. Yet, not yet. You know, when, when it's, it's, it's when, when things, when you start to sweat is when it happens, when, when, when things get hairy. Um, you know, later, the, the, you know, the, this became the, the look. And this had even more right. of that dye than uh than the other one did um they, they they scrapped the first look because it was too similar to christian bale's hair and, and everything so um but yeah no they just like would slather in this like moose this like black moose crap and there is the the danger that if uh you know it's very hot or it rains or you're really nervous um, that it could start to trickle down your temples. And um, in my case, uh, on the movie set, I had a, I had like people hired <laughs> to be there to make sure that that wouldn't happen while the camera was rolling. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, Rudy didn't have the luxury of the, the same expert team also, also, um, I think there's the small matter of you are a professional who was playing a role and you knew you knew your lines, right? You knew what you were supposed to do and you'd probably done the background work to prepare for the role. Uh, and so including, you know, talking to Judge Katzman uh, and talking to, to his brother. Right. And so you didn't have that moment where you're standing in front of everybody with the cameras rolling and you realize you are just talking out of your ass. Well, it's funny you say that, but in, in the particular case of that movie, American Hustle, um, it was more like the latter description you just gave than <laughs> any other movie I've ever done. And the reason is that, um, David O. Russell, you know, he, he's a famous director. He, a, apart from that, he directed Silver Linings Playbook and um, I Heart Huckabees and Spanking the Monkey and The Fighter. Uh, and, you know, he's, he's kind of uh, approaching legendary status. But uh, in addition to being known for his genius as a director, he's also notoriously like insane and uh you know in a kind of touched way like like uh you know sort of um mad genius 
style and he has like a, a way of directing that is unlike anybody else that I'd ever worked with and not everybody can get hip to it. Um, so what does it involve? Where, so what he does is, um, you know, I, I was sent the script and everything and I had read the script and I'd learned my lines backwards and forwards and I was totally prepared to say them. But when I got there on the day, he 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 doesn't light a, a room like normally the way you shoot a scene is you'll light everything for one side of the room and you'll shoot everything that's going in that direction on that side of the room. And you'll, you know, classically, you would start with a wider shot and then you would come in a little bit closer and then, you know, eventually you get into the close ups. And each time you change the camera angle slightly, you have to kind of relight, and it's an arduous and boring process that so, can so make like a beautiful it, picture. But in a tr in a typical really hard for in a typical for everybody else to in a typical shooting, how many times would you shoot the same scene? So uh, let's just say like the classic thing would be one big wide shot that gets like the whole room, one say let's say there are, let's say there are three people in the scene so you get a two shot of the people on one side and then you come in you might get a close-up of one and then a close-up of the other and then you turn around and get a like a mid-sized shot of the guy on the other side and then a close-up of the other guy that's like typical but but you know inventive directors who aren't just doing the same boring like tv coverage on a scene might find some interesting angle that's from over on the side of your face that then swings around and becomes something else or whatever. So there's, you know, a, an unlimited um, set of possibilities for it. And you can end up doing a scene, you know, many, many times. And for each of those angles, you do, I don't know, five to 10 takes. So you do the scene like a hundred times, you know, every time you do it. But David does it differently than anybody else. And what he does is he doesn't have any lights in the room. He just has this one big globe. I mean, he has like practical lights, like the real lights that would be in the room. And he has this big globe, warm globe that's lit up like a Chinese lantern type thing. And somebody just holds it up above the camera. And <clears throat> the camera is either like on a handheld shoulder kind of thing or on a steady cam rig which like keeps it from sort of jiggling too much but it allows total mobility to move it around <clears throat> and he tucks himself in next to the camera guy and he holds this little monitor next to him and he's watching there and he's right next to the camera right there watching you but watching you down here and as he calls action he starts talking throughout the take and he starts telling first of all he tells the camera guy where to point the camera so during the take in the middle while you're acting he's saying go to go to alessandro go to the phone go to down to the phone go but how up, do you keep your concentration on the scene when he does wall. that well so then further he starts telling you new lines to say <laughs> during the take and so he'll yell out like i'll say my line which was you know um telegio didn't show uh how many hours will it be before he gives us an answer and he'll say no say say telegio didn't show i need an answer now and you say telegio didn't show i need an answer now no say telegio didn't show i needed an answer yesterday telegio didn't show i needed an answer yesterday and it goes on like this and it becomes this kind of like weird psychedelic hypnotic exercise between you and him where you become kind of conjoined and uh you give up all any kind of preparation that you've done as far as like how you were going to say the lines uh a pause you were going to take uh, a moment that you were going to you know grab your glass and and take a drink and how do you stay in character yeah well that i mean the whole thing works if you really have done your homework on that side of it and you come in just like feeling like you are the guy and then you can just do whatever. It doesn't matter anymore. Then you just give yourself over to this kind of weird 
Um, <laughs> you know, like, you know, Sanford Meisner, this famous acting teacher used to do these exercises we called repetition exercises where you would say something and then like your scene partner would just repeat it back to you and you would go back and forth and back and forth. And it was all about reacting and not worrying about what you were saying, but just like being in this, in this moment and that here and now. And, and that's what it kind of became like. You just kind of, you give up all of your sort of pre-planned ways of saying things. And it just like, it, you know, you just let it rip and you give yourself over to him, like a kind of almost like a puppet or whatever. And, and there's something weirdly liberating about it. I mean, and it gives his movies this kind of slightly frantic, um, but very energized and spontaneous, almost improvised feel to them. Um, anyway, so it, it wasn't unlike the feeling <laughs> that Rudy Giuliani must have had uh, today <laughs> when he was giving his press conference. But I do want to um, say that Rudy Giuliani could comfort himself in knowing that he was only the second most deranged person because oh he was there, because he was there he, like he wasn't even a close second. Sidney <laughs> Powell is in a whole different league and she must make him feel really sane and and under control um so you know you do you rudy i have a question so when you i i, I was actually just wondering this the other day how much well, I was watching The Mandalorian, which was as discussed by, on this show, I have mixed feelings on. But I was thinking about how, like, how much, as you just said, kind of described this, I was like, how much acting actors have to do without any, but in front of green screens and without any of the things that they're, I mean, they've had to do this for a long time, but especially now, I just feel like they're doing so much acting without even like necessarily being in the same room as the person they're talking to or supposedly talking to. Has that gotten, is that something that like you're, that like they do particular training in, or is that something that is, uh, that is particularly difficult or is it like what you just described? Like you just end up going with it and doing whatever you need to do. Uh, well, it, it all depends on what kind of movie it is. Um, movies like The Mandalorian that are like futuristic space kind of things or whatever, or Avengers or, you know, superhero shit where you have to fly and, and um, you know, do kind of supernatural things. Uh, there's a lot of special effects involved. And, and so, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I haven't really... I haven't had to do that much of that. I, I have, a, I mean, I've done it. Like I, I, I was in the arc three and there was a lot of, yeah, there were a lot of green screens in it. And half the time that was still in an era where they were kind of segueing from these big animatronic monsters and things into like totally computer generated things. And so it was kind of half and half and they did have like some enormous, dinosaurs and things that were actually there and then there were other times where you know you were just like having to imagine that something was there that wasn't um I, you know that movie those kinds of movies are usually just so boring to film there you wait in your trailer for 14 hours and then you come out and you like run from one side of a sound stage to another and then you go back to your trip. <laughs> that's, your, that's your day. And that goes on for like six months. Um, so I, like, I haven't done a lot of that. Um, you know, nowadays, even in like, you know, classic dramas, I mean, the, the movie I just finished is the, the uh, Many Saints of Newark, which is the, the prequel to the Sopranos series, which Warner Brothers has made as a feature film. Oh, cool. And uh, yeah, no, it's, I mean, this was, it's the biggest, um, uh, like, uh, I don't know what you say, like, it, it's the biggest event in my career to date, because I'm the lead role in it. And um, oh, great. It's brilliantly written thing by by David Chase, who wrote all of the Sopranos. And um, yeah, I finally get to play it. I've spent my whole life. Like, yeah, I want to. I want to talk about the. 
the the ethnic uh, 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 composition of your roles, which is really interesting. So, yeah. like, you, you well, are this actually is the first time, really, that like <laughs> I've been. You know, this is the first time where my name like didn't get in makes the way sense in the, the role. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So, in fact, so, I, so I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I only got the role because of my name. <laughs> so you have yeah. recently played what I think is one of the hardest things for, you know, a reasonably secular person to do, which is to play a, a member of the ultra orthodox community, um, which involves. Uh, some real submersion into uh, a, a, a lifestyle and a set of life assumptions that most of us go through life without ever thinking about, let, let alone experiencing. What was, what was that like and, and, and how do you do it? Um, <clears throat> well, uh, that is like, you know, the I, I basically, um, you know, there I, there are different kinds of actors. There are there are actors who um, have just their own, you know, just trade on their own magnetism and and um, presence and you know power and humor that it, you know is is particular to them and is appealing to the world at large and um and then there are actors who are you know trying to kind of hide in their roles and i'm that kind um <laughs> I, i've mo you know I, I i've spent most of my career playing people that are really different than me and i uh, you know, whether it's some kind of like psychological compulsion or what, like, you know, uh, I, I'd need to talk to an analyst to, to work that out. But I, I definitely have from the very start, like wanted to kind of disguise myself. And I, you know, maybe, I don't know, my dad uh, used to do um, great impressions when I was a kid. I don't know if he ever did that with you, but but growing up, he he was like a like he did impressions a lot at the dinner table. Did he ever? He did, that wasn't something you remember of him. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, I don't think I have ever I ever saw him do an impression. Well, he he was, he was great really at was making fun at of people, but it was <laughs> it wasn't usually in my experience anyway in the form of um, in the form of mimicry. Well, he was a great mimic, and um, I, uh, I kind of, I, I think that I, like, grew up admiring that in him. That was one of the things that, like, he always, it made me laugh, and I would, uh, you know, he was, he could really evoke uh, people that we knew, and, um, and so I, uh, I, I think that's kind of, like, how I started out as an actor, being a, a mimic, really, and, um, I had a knack for like voices and accents and like physical things that may, you know, sort of transformed me into something else. And, um, you know, that that movie Disobedience, where I played an Orthodox rabbi, was like probably, um, yeah, maybe the furthest afield that I've gone. But uh, but that to me is like the the most enjoyable part of it is is preparing for a role like that where you get access to a world that you would never have access to otherwise and people are are weirdly um unguarded with actors who are researching roles whether it's you know and, and in this case there were probably two reasons one was that they are kind of drawn to the glamour of Hollywood, no matter who they are, even like, you know, Orthodox uh, Hasids in, uh, you know, Crown Heights or whatever, where I was spending a lot of time, they can't help but be kind of fascinated by Hollywood and all that kind of thing. And so they, they anybody anywhere in the world wants to kind of 
be close to that and is just curious about the mystery of it. And then on the other hand, they're all like really suspicious that you're going to misrepresent them and do it badly. <laughs> and so um, for both of those reasons, they, uh, you know, there were people there who really invited me in to that community um, in a way that I, you know, I've spent my life, half my life living in New York and, and walking through those um, neighborhoods and never having anybody even like, you know, um, look me in the eye. And suddenly I was uh, at Shabbos dinner, you know, with an uh, ultra Orthodox family and um, completely um, made part of that experience and going to shul and all of it. And, and, and so all of that, those experiences are, are what uh, are almost maybe more satisfying than the actual performance. It's really interesting. So I want to, before we go to audience questions, I want to talk a little bit about your family because people know that you're married to Emily Mortimer. Uh, and there's this like part of your family that like people know a little, a, lo a lot about. It's a sort of celebrity family thing. But, you know, because, you know, because what people don't know is this incredible, uh, family that you come from, uh, and this amazing diversity of artists that this family has produced over at least three generations. I, I'm, uh, I, I, I don't, I don't know that I know the whole story, but, uh, like your, I first ran into this when your dad invited me over to dinner once and I <clears throat> walked into you know, his and Catherine's apartment in, in Washington. And the first thing you notice is the in unbelievable art collection that is in this Washington apartment, including a Calder mobile that's hanging in the living room. And, um, and as I, and then uh, the amount of it, as I sort of queried Pietro about it, that was just made in this circle uh, this artist circle that your grandfather was a part of on Long Island is just an, it's an incredible story. And your brother's a sculptor in, in New York. I, so like, tell us about this family and, and, you know, this kind of multi-generational and incredible diverse, diverse group of artists and also the circle that it collected around it. Um, yeah, well, so, uh, my grandfather, on my father's side, my, my grandfather was uh, a sculptor from Sardinia named Costantino, Cost Costantino Nivola, Costantino Nivola. And he, um, met, you know, he was like, grew up in, in total poverty in a tiny little village in the mountains, uh, in the middle of the island. Um, his dad was away fighting in the First World War, and they were literally starving. He was one of nine children, and um, and he had met uh, he met a um, uh, a church fresco painter who, when he was like a young teenager, who took him on as an apprentice. I think he had like a facility for drawing or something. I'm not sure how that happened, but. He ended up uh, going around the island with this church fresco painter, um, painting churches in all all over Sardinia. In fact, that was he told me that was where he lost his faith, because he said that um, w the the master painter would sleep in the house of the you know uh, priest, but he had to sleep in the like in the church on some like cold pew or something. And in the middle of the winter it was freezing. And he said, you know, every night I pray to Jesus Christ to save me from this misery. And he never come. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, so he, he, he then um, got a scholarship to go. And I will study. also become Jewish for that after that. <laughs> like, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> that 
would definitely like you just have to go to the top you got to go to yahweh yeah <laughs> <laughs> Um, but he got a uh, he got a scholarship to an art school in Milan to study under this very important Italian sculptor named Ma Marino Marini, and uh, so he went um, to Milan. He was like you know one of the only people in his village ever to leave the island, much less go to this kind of cosmopolitan city and study art under an important artist. And while he was there, meanwhile, my grandmother was a, a German Jew from uh, Frankfurt. I thought she was Romanian. No, her grandparents were Russian Jews. She was German Jew. Her dad was a German Jewish doctor. Uh, her last name, her name was Ruth Guggenheim, but not of, of the Guggenheims. The, the other um, Guggenheims. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was like, so the I know where you got the old the art collection. Now. I know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and they, uh, she, um, you know, in, in her like youth, um, you know, everything was starting to happen in, in, um, Germany under the, the Nazis and she, uh, her family in the thirties, uh, got frightened and left fairly early on and went to, and moved to Milan to get away from um from the the you know from the, the nazis and she was then kind of growing up in milan from i want to say like 11 years old or something and she'd been there a number of years before she then went to the same art school and that's where they met and then as the war was just beginning her parents uh went to new york first with her sister and she stayed to marry my grandfather and they stayed behind and were back in Sardinia. And then in dramatic way, were woken up in the middle of the night one night and told that um, they were, that one of their closest friends had been informing on them and he broke down in tears and begged their forgiveness and told them to run as uh, that night. And they packed their bags and they went to France and then um, they had friends in the underground and and with like fake passports and all kinds of things, uh, got on a boat to New York and came to New York and had nothing, had no money. They were working as janitors in a hospital and and um, living in a, what my grandmother always called a cold water flat in, in uh, Greenwich Village in the 40s. And... Um, and slowly, you know, things started to happen. Um, he got uh, some big, well, he started working for, uh, as a graphic designer for Interiors Magazine. And then he got some, some um, commissions from the Olivetti Company to do these big, uh, beautiful bar reliefs in their showroom on Fifth Avenue. And, and they then moved out. They were one of the first artists to move out to eastern long island to to the springs near amagansett which was um at that time just farmland and this guy tony vaccaro who is a great photographer who's still alive now in his 90s had kind of tipped them off about some property out there and they went out and bought this kind of land out there and, and on an old farmhouse and they set up this kind of artist's compound there, which Ben, you know, well, you've been there a lot. And um, and over the years, like people started moving, all the abstract expressionist uh, painters and sculptors from New York and expatriates from the war all kind of moved out there in this community. And there was Pollock and Rothko and Saul Steinberg and de Kooning and I mean, there's a list a mile long of these really important artists who moved to that area at that time. And there was a, a community that they all kind of um, shared. And, and just to give you an idea of how intimate this community was. Uh, so um, I was at Pietro's apartment once and I noticed this incredible uh, uh, drawing on the wall, which was actually a it was a Steinberg. Uh, and it was a drawing of two women arguing passionately. And one of them was arguing about 
uh, the, you, you actually can't describe it, but she's saying Sardinia and the other is saying Corsica, uh, and it, but it comes out of their mouth in, in Steinberg like <laughs> maps. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, and I noticed that it like looked like Steinberg and quite naively actually. And Catherine uh, said, oh, it is, you know, and then, I, you know, I just sort of asked her, I'm like, how do you happen to have a Steinberg drawing, I mean, on, on your wall? And she says, oh, Ben, you haven't seen anything. And she takes out this book, which is a baby book that Saul Steinberg made for Pietro uh, on his birth. And it is an alphabet book um, in <laughs> Italian um, uh, in which there is, uh, it is an anti-fascist themed alphabet book. So A uh, is, you know, the, like F is fascista and B is bomba. <laughs> And M is Mierda, and it's a picture of Mussolini. Um, oh, my God. Uh, and, and it's all just, like, none of it's ever been published. It's just this yeah. book that uh, that Steinberg made for baby Pietro. Um, and that's the, like, that's this community. You know, in fact, I'm looking, this, in fact, this uh, thing right behind me is a Saul Steinberg that, that he... I don't know. Can you see this? He, um, can you see that? There? Wait, can you, you see that? Yep, it says, we, we can see, we can Fortuny. see it. That, that, that's me. <laughs> uh, and he, uh, he made that for me. He and I had like a birthday that was like a day or two apart from each other. And he, I used to give him toys, which he loved and he would give me art. <laughs> I have, oh, there's another thing on my, this is a great one that wow. he gave to me. Look at that. <laughs> oh, it's backwards, isn't it? It says now. No, it's no, it's, it's frontwards no, to it's you. It's backwards to you, but it's backwards. It's, it's, oh, yeah, it says now. <laughs> it's a clock that says now. Um, no, but the best, the best story of that whole era was that um, Pollock, you know, they all used to give each other art all the time, and, and Pollock gave my grandfather paintings sometimes and he, he gave my he gave my grandfather this big painting i even have a there's a picture of it which is can you see that mm -hmm. okay so that is my grandfather here go away whatever that um that's my grandfather sitting in a chair looking at in in our house there looking at this pollock painting it was an early painting before the splatter stuff and that right there is my dad peeking around the corner <laughs> and that's and that's uh claire his sister and ruth my grandmother and he put it up there and he sat like that and he stared at it for a week and at the end of the week he took it down and he gave it back to pollock and he said Jackson, I cannot keep this painting. It makes me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> and oh he, my gave, God. he gave the painting back. And about four years ago, I was like walking through the um, Pollock retrospective at MoMA. And I'm no, it's not this there, is room. it? And I look up and I see this painting and it looks so familiar because I'd seen this picture a million times before. It looked so familiar. And I pull up that picture and sure enough, it's that painting. And then I did a little research on it and they bought it at Sotheby's for like $25 million. <laughs> Excellent. That would make me, I would get over my nerves if that was like the case. So, uh, um, so you are, are you the first member of the family that, I mean, I know your aunt does children's books. Um, uh, are you the first member of the family in the performing arts as opposed to the visual arts? Yes. Um, the only person in the performing arts in my family uh, was my great grandmother on my mother's side. And my mother comes from the opposite kind of family. She was from like a really waspy family. And 
her grandmother was like her last name was Chatfield Taylor, <laughs> and, uh, you know, she, and she like was lived on the North Shore, of Massachusetts, you know, in 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 uh, you know uh, Manchester, like you know, in, or someplace near there, in some like big old uh, colonial house by the sea, and she was from this like really a Brahmin type, I don't know, posh type family. And she was apparently the first woman ever to go to the Yale School of Drama wow. uh, back in God knows when that would have been. I mean, like early 20th century. And um, uh, so she, uh, so that's my only like connection to any kind of, I don't know if she actually went on to become a, a um, an actress like professionally or not. I mean, at that time, obviously it was just so not cool if you were, um, you know, if you were from that kind of a family. But um, but I, I know that she did go to Yale School of Drama and that she was the first woman. My that's, father, that's actually, you know, and it's a pretty my dad actually, actually interesting was a distinction. Kind of rebel. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, no, I, I, I'm I'm proud to have her as part of my uh, lineage. But my dad um, was actually kind of a, a rebel against, you know, his becoming a sort of intellectual was a you know um, a, a, a kind of rebellion against. Um, I think my grandparents like bohemian lifestyle and I, he describes as a kid growing up and hearing them talk about politics. And of course it was all these artists sitting around getting drunk and sounding off about their leftist, uh, you know, commie views. And, and he just like, it really pissed him off because he felt like nobody knew what they were talking about and nobody had any like, you know, grasp of the facts. And, and this and that stuck was with one of the, and no, and this stuck with Pietro in a huge way. I mean, he yeah. became one of these Washington. Uh, I mean, he was a political scientist by training, but he was a, a policy intellectual and also a, a cultivator of other policy intellectuals. And he had his his politics were complicated and diverse. But what was so consistent about him was his contempt for people who were not factual in their, you know, he, he could, he would have, he had time for, for all sorts of people of quite diverse politics, but you could get him to sneer if you were not factually serious. And, and, yeah. and this is, uh, I, I never thought of it as sort of an outgrowth of growing up among artists, but it's it, definitely it one of the things that I associate was. with him. All right. I let's always go. Took, have you... took me to task as a kid in that exact way. <laughs> There's like that old adage that like, um, you know, that, um, people who work with their hand, like a carpenter wants his, his the kid to be the boss and the boss or the man or like the manager wants their kid to be a professional, like a lawyer or a doctor, the lawyers and the doctors want their kids to be intellectuals and intellectuals want their kids to be artists. And then like artists want their kids to be ditch diggers and it all kind of goes around again. Um, <laughs> but I think that that's kind of I think that that's kind of right. There's like a weird way of like of of rebelling uh, by breaking out of the mold. If you're in that type of thing and you're at like the artist level, where do you go from there? Yeah, I mean, I, that's absolutely true. I mean, I, I feel that way about my own kids. Um, I, I weirdly, I think my grandfather, my dad's dad, wasn't sort of I, I think he might have liked my dad to have wanted to take on an artistic life and he really encouraged my dad's younger sister to you know who did become an artist um in you know to to do that and he felt very kind of close to her because of it i think it was my dad's choice to go a different route and and i think it uh, you know just there's something about the way he described those evenings and they look to me in photographs that I've seen so romantic, like them 
sitting outside in these patios drinking wine and there's a like fire going and there's like cool murals behind them and everybody in like kind of odd but beautiful clothes and and uh you know smoking and you know it was just looked like uh, what you would imagine like the kind of village scene of the 50s might have been and and not what you would imagine east hampton to look like well no i mean it's a different time you know i mean he my dad went to the local springs public school there i mean there it was only these artists and then the local uh you know people who were farmers or fishermen or you know um construction workers or whatever you know there's still in that area in springs it's the kind of last area in out east where there's still a kind of local population of working class people who are not like nouveau riche or whatever um but and then there's those mixed with the artists that one area is still like that and it's interesting it's like it, it harkens back to a different time where you had this marriage of like you know leftist intellectuals and like real working class people who uh you know had the same values and um where you know that was the sort of the the old democratic party um which is gone now and that's why the democrats can't get a foothold in in you know so much of this country anymore and um, it's really interesting like that one little area kind of represents uh, a bygone era where those two populations were, you know, still kind of in the same camp. Interesting. Yeah. All right, let's do some audience questions. Christopher Argerus, up late as always in Hi. London. Hi. Stuff. Hi, Sandra. I'm chatting a little bit here, so I think you know what's coming. Uh, <laughs> what was your experience uh, like filming the goal uh, a football or soccer match scenes during an actual Newcastle United Liverpool match before uh, 52,000 52, okay. fans. So I wanted to compare sort of the, the experience of like you're, you're an actor, but you're playing an, an athlete having to perform before a big crowd. So what was, how is that compared to acting before a stage or a closed set? We have an actual live audience, you know, in the stands. So what he's talking about is this movie that I did a long time ago uh, that was a soccer movie um, called Goal that uh, where I played this kind of David Beckham, like, you know, lovable rogue type character who played for, well, there were two movies. The first one was uh, up in Newcastle and then the second one was down in Madrid uh, at Real Madrid. And I had been offered this movie and it was this kind of weird film that had been financed by Adidas. And I, I'm a huge soccer fan and I just couldn't resist it because they told me I was going to get to train with all of the most famous players in the world. And, <laughs> you know, I, 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 sure enough, um, in the first film, I was sent up to Newcastle to um, train with all these like legendary English players. And, um, and then how'd it um, go so so it was it, it, the, the the funny thing was the way that they shot the, the there was the regular story which had, was written by the guys who wrote the commitments um and it was a kind of cliche story but but well written and and it worked and it's kind of like you know uh archetypal sports uh movie way and um but the the unique thing about it was that we the way that we shot the actual matches was they would sh shoot a real match with like 10 cameras around the stadium and they'd get the whole match. And then the next day we would come back and they would choose a few key moments from the real match and bring a, a few of the real players back to the stadium and recreate those moments with me and this other actor who was in it, like, integrated in with them and then the, the and so that suddenly like you'd be seeing the real match and then suddenly i'd be there like doing incredible things and um the final piece of the puzzle was that they wanted the end of the match to get us on the field with all the players and all the fans like applauding and the cheering and the end of the match and so 
we would on a real match day get dressed up in the in the like um uniforms and hide behind the advertising boards that were on the sides of the fields and when they the final whistle would blow we'd come popping up and jump over these things and go running out there they'd sprayed us down with water to make it look like we been <laughs> sweating and playing and we go running out there and come running up to these players who had no idea that we were who the fuck we were and we would come running <laughs> up to them and like start hugging them and everything and like celebrating and like cheering to the fans and everything and the one thing i was always nervous about was after everybody you know after the match i didn't our trailers were out in the parking lot and i didn't want to have to like in my cleats like click clack down the hallway out through to get to my trailer while the fans were still leaving the, the grounds and so i um i ended up waiting i'd sit and wait for like a half hour until everybody had cleared out and then i would like click clack back to my trailer but one of the times we were doing it i was on my way back and i hear this guy with this like thick Newcastle accent and my, you know my character's name was Gavin Harris and, and I hear you know hey Harris you know and I'm like oh fuck here we go you know and I turn around and he says you played great <laughs> it's like such a dream I feel like they're amazing all right David Botts the floor is yours but uh, thank you so much. Um, so a question for you is, as a producer, would you have accepted a script depicting a scenario whereby an impeached president resists election outcomes aided by a retired <laughs> lawyer in the midst of a global pandemic? I guess we could talk about killer uh, murder hornets as well. Um, but... Um, do, do you have suggestions on, on uh, making how it more American realistic? Can get have out of this. Seen, have you ever seen a movie called Bowfinger? Yes. <laughs> it, it's this. So, so this is like the script that arrives for Steve Martin on the FedEx uh, truck, you know, that he <laughs> delivers to Steve Martin, who plays this like total charlatan producer who's just completely like hopeless and has this like rat tail and like is living in some shitty apartment in Hollywood and is just like waiting for some script to arrive in the mail that he could produce. And what comes is this thing called chubby rain and the, and <laughs> chubby rain becomes this film that he decides to produce that he does completely on the fly with Eddie Murphy, uh, who plays, the bro both uh, a big action star and the like loser brother of the action star who he hires to to who's a twin to the, to the actual real star and he hires him to be that's what this story you just described is like it's like the worst script that could be delivered that only the most like hopeless like d-list producer would ever think could be made could people could buy as a real legitimate story dan wisneski the floor is yours except i can't uh, okay. for some uh, reason can't make you visible but we can oh there you are there he is okay <laughs> sorry uh thanks uh i was just uh alessandro uh you i didn't realize you were in the movie face off a long time ago um which is just such a just such an amazing premise for a movie and I know it was a while back, um, but if are you, can you remember like the what thoughts went through your head when you like first heard the premise of the movie and that you were going to get to actually play, you know, the brother of Nicolas Cage in this just amazingly absurd situation? Yeah. Well, that was really like my first movie. I mean, I had done one or two small things out of time, but that was my first Hollywood movie, and. Um, I was sent the script. I thought it was just like the stupidest idea you'd ever heard. Like two guys change faces. Like I mean, it just sounded like the dumbest thing. And I didn't know who John Woo was. I, I you know, people after, you know, I worked with him. I, I, then I, you know, once I got this part, I realized, oh, he's like this legendary 
uh, Chinese action director, but when when they first sent me the thing, I mean, I I hadn't ever seen any of his movies, and so I, it just seemed like a really dumb idea. And um, but I met with him, and and they offered me the role, and the role was really in in the original script. It was kind of like a young. I don't know, if Ben. If you, I don't know if you guys have seen this movie. I but... have. I have seen Face Off, and I have yeah. actually seen a lot of John Woo movies. Okay, well, there, you, you were like, the, if you had read the script when it arrived, you would have understood the style of the whole thing. But Probably I, not. I it's time, one of the stupidest premises I you could imagine <laughs> for a film. I... Yeah, it's up but there. I, it's like... <laughs> I mean, I you, know. Thought, you know. In the original script, it was my part was written as like a younger carbon copy of Nicolas Cage's part. And I was just like, and you know, he, he was described as having like leather pants, and I was like this kind of like just mini me type thing. And I, and when I got the job, I just realized, well, Nicolas Cage is such an outsized character himself that there, it's a it's a losing battle trying to compete with that, and so I have to go the other way. And I had been watching this movie about. Um, a 1970s psychedelic cartoon artist named Robert Crumb. Um, and and uh, there was a, Terry Zweigoff made this documentary called Crumb and it, it, it was about him and he's this really eccentric, weird guy. And he's one of, uh, he's got two siblings who were also really eccentric and weird. And so I was trying to think of a model of like two brothers who are, you know, both of them are kind of cracked. And this seemed like a, a good idea. And so I took this uh, movie and I showed it to Nick and, you know, Nick watched it and he just, he just flipped when he watched it. He was like, ah, uh, Alessandro, uh, very dark. Uh, <laughs> you know, I like it. Uh, let's, let's play with this. Oh, let's play with it. Um, you know, and so we started doing these improv improvisations in his trailer and, uh, you know, making up the this kind of weird relationship between these two characters, one who was uh, this sort of genius, but who couldn't really do basic functions like tie his own shoelaces. And the other one who was this like very charismatic kind of wild man and what that relationship would be like, um, all based on the Crumb Brothers. And that was the kind of genesis of the whole thing. And in fact, you know, the, the costumers, I asked, I said, look, I don't want any of this club gear. You know, I want to look like Woody Allen. I want like <laughs> wide whale cords and things, you know, and like a sweater vest and stuff. And now I'm going to rewatch this movie <laughs> with the idea of it being influenced by the Crumb Brothers. Well, jo oh John God. Woo, when, you know, when these big action movies, sometimes like directors just they can't keep track of all the elements and i was just wheeled in front of him on the day that we were about to start shooting and he had never seen like pictures of my costumes or anything and i was not at all what he had in mind you know and he took one look at me and i remember and i was standing there in my like you know cords and you know my little glasses and whatever and he i remember him like looking like down and then up and all he said was okay but you have machine gun <laughs> and, <laughs> and then, then that was it like from there on and he let me do whatever i want as long as i had as long gun. as you had the machine gun all right we got two more questions we got to let you go more or less on time because it's adrian's birthday and we don't want to make you late for that so tony kava the floor is yours hey uh I'm glad you mentioned Marino Marini. I studied art in Florence, and he was like my super favorite uh, 20th century Italian artist. It's amazing. Um, also, we used to run into our crumbs brother at a Vietnamese restaurant called Toulon on Skid Row. In Which San brother? Francisco. Charles or the, the the one with the floss. If you remember the one with the floss, yes. what he, he did with the floss, eat, he would eat floss. Yes, and then and, shit it yeah. out. And and then, like, basically, one end of it, whole body. Yeah. Oh. Right. And, and we were amazed because he had groupies following him around. 
there's these beautiful young girls like chasing them down the street. So fame is all it's cracked up to be. <laughs> <laughs> never um, going to be able to like unsee that mental image that I just created. Thank you guys so the much. Brother, the other brother <laughs> Charles like kept I don't want to know. Got smaller <laughs> and smaller and smaller until they right. the handwriting you couldn't even see anymore. And he committed suicide. Yeah, I so. think that's a classic sign of psychosis is that, that yeah. handwriting thing. So um I wanted to ask just about your acting and working with Christian Bales, the first part of the question. Um, aside from all the rumors, which I'm not interested in because I really super respect his work and I love watching him. He's amazing. And uh, I was wondering how challenging it was to work with him and if his uh, kind of his intensity brought, if you felt like it brought out more kind of the best in you and the rest of the cast. Um, yeah, I, you know, I've actually worked with Christian Bale twice. Um, the first time was in a movie called Laurel Canyon, um, which was at the early on in my career. I can't remember what year it was, but you know, early 2000 sometime. And, um, and then he was in American Hustle as well. I mean, he was the star of American Hustle. I was in American Hustle. Um, he, uh, I, you know, I, look, he's a very intense guy and I think I've seen like some weird videos of him like screaming at uh, guys on the yeah, ground. Yeah, he like screamed or, at like a grip or something or like, I don't know. Like, yeah, there was some video not... where he said like, I'm yeah. going to take your head off and shit down your neck or something like that. <laughs> um, and, and then connect I... the two together with floss. I don't know. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> I, no, the floss, give the guy a break. The floss didn't come into it. Um, I, um, my experience with him was have both been great um i i really admire him as an actor i think he's one of the really like all-time greats and he's he you know he's an actor of the kind that i you know see myself as you know he he's very transformative and um uh, you know, he, he plays with his weight in, in ways that are kind of disturbing sometimes, but like he's, he, he really is um, totally committed in, as a, as a character actor. Like, you know, he's a character leading man, I guess you'd call it. Uh, like Daniel Day-Lewis and like Sean Penn or, you know. Um, and uh, I really like, he, you know, it's, he's totally, totally committed at work. He's really only interested in, in just like, the job he's doing he, he doesn't like to sit around and and shoot the shit and make small talk and and um uh, you know he's all he's all purpose but so he's fun at way... parties is what you're saying i think he like he, he's <laughs> perfectly easy going as a as a guy like off you know off you know when you when the working day is done like he's he's totally you know he's not like uh, you're gonna like stare you down and like Klaus Kinski or something. Like he's 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 relaxed, nice, warm guy. But uh, when he comes to work, like he doesn't stay on the set and sit around and chit chat in between takes or in between setups. Like he goes back to his trailer and waits until it's time to perform and then comes back and then does it. And um, you know, uh, and then when you know even if you're on location or whatever, he, he's kind of stays with his family and that kind of thing. And um, I, I like, I kind of agree with that way of working. I, I find it really enervating to sit on the set and talk about the weather to people. Um, it, it, it's, it's like the, the filming process is, it's a really, it takes so much, patience and concentration and you a, a big part of it is these long periods where you have to wait for them to set up these shots that sometimes take hours and you have to kind of like keep your energy and your concentration for those you know hours before having to do the same scene again and to kind of come back emotionally to the place that you were uh in the last shot and that is uh you know some actors feed off of like the feeling, the energy of being on the set and joking around with everybody. Like John Travolta on Face Up, 
he and Nicolas Cage were a perfect example. Like John Travolta would, you know, be like a clowning for everybody and joking around and chit chatting, talking, and then they, they'd call action and he'd suddenly just like start the scene. And he kind of was fed by that um, uh, feeling of, you know, being around people and, and interacting with everybody. Whereas Nick would kind of just like leave and was very shy and quiet and would leave until it was the moment that he had to actually perform. And then he would just appear and then start the scene. I feel like more and more as I've gone along that I, I prefer that way of working like the Christian Bale, Nicolas Cage way. Cause I just don't have enough. I just don't have the energy and I, I, I can't like, just flip around you know that quickly into a scene like i just i just want to be like alone and sit quietly and read or listen to music or whatever it is without having the pressure of having to kind of um come up with a conversation with people so christians like that and i totally respect him for it and and i i dig it um but i haven't uh, encountered any like you know whatever you know like intense rage, but he's like a very, very powerful actor. Like he's obviously got this well of, of, you know, all kinds of different, you know, emotional uh, sides to him. So uh, I, I don't know what was going on in that particular day. I, I tend to want to give him the benefit of the doubt. I'm sure like, you know, sometimes the way that sets work, you know, the last thing they're thinking about is, the way that the actor needs to concentrate because there's it's such a technical medium there's so many things that have to be done and sometimes people forget you know that there's something that you know what the scene is about or like what has to be done in the scene so maybe i don't know you know or else maybe like he just like got pissed off i don't know <laughs> Pat Gunn, to me, so. you get the you get the last question today howdy so uh th thanks for joining us um it's it's great to uh, uh great to hear from you and uh, and about your experiences as an actor um, I'm wondering, after you get into the headspace for playing a role, do you ever find yourself later thinking back about how that character would react to your everyday life? And in particular with characters where you had a role in shaping them, I was thinking particularly about Pollock's Troy, but uh, yes, we, we probably have a lot of face-off fans uh, uh, among us, but, but, uh, but just in general, is that something that you experience uh, having gone through that experience of putting yourself into that mental space? Well, I mean, I think what you're asking really is about, you know, what the relationship is between you as like the person, the actor and you as the role. And, um, <clears throat> you know, again, there are some people like, uh, you know, Robert Redford or somebody or, you know, some of the great actors who just really are able to kind of be themselves in a really relaxed and open way and they allow the kind of the the gaze of the camera into themselves and that is like there's something about them that you just like want to watch and about their way that's just so like comfortable and uh compelling that, that you want to watch it and then there are other actors who are you know really doing like a sort of like you know it's like pyrotechnics it's like you know magicians or something it's, it's a different slightly different school it almost probably comes from vaudeville or I, I don't know some other discipline where it's all about like you know trickery and you know um i i think that the the best actors the best character actors like christian bale or like daniel day lewis or whatever are people who like have an ability to kind of, uh, you know, do that, 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 that trickery, but still bring some part of some essential part of themselves into the performance, into the role so that it, it, it's not just like completely divorced from, from you. It's like, you're still, you're still bringing your own experience, your own heart, your own passions, your own, like, you know, emotional life into the experience of this other person that you're playing. Um, so from the very start of working on a role, I'm always thinking about like my own experience as it relates to the the life of this character. But at the same time, like I get obsessed with tiny, tiny little details 
about you know the person's physicality or speech or um, what their personal experience might have been that's different than mine, you know, that that doesn't actually bear any relationship to my life. Um, so like, you know, Pollux Troy, I think one of the big things, you know, look, I'm playing a bomb maker who's a terrorist, basically, <laughs> who's been like, you know, had some kind of like childhood trauma that's turned him in, you know, and he's slightly autistic. And um, but at the same time, like his relationship with his brother was the thing in, in that film that was most compelling about him and their sort of strange way, way of interacting with each other and how well they knew each other and how they had almost like a, uh, you know, a, a second language that they that they had a short, you know, a, a, a shorthand together. And and so and, and what about that feeling of like sharing some sort of personal history with somebody does to you and, and how that like binds you together in a way that where you would just die for each other or whatever. And that it to me, like apart from all of the physical and, you know, uh, things that I'd laid on to it was the sort of heart of the character. And, and those were things that I could really identify with uh, as myself. In my own life. So we, I know we have to go, but I have like one final question to ask, which is that I'm kind of very curious if being an actor has ruined watching movies and TV for you. And if it hasn't, what are you watching right now? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, it definitely makes you watch movies and TV in a different way. Um, you're so much more aware of all of the kind of technical elements that go into it. And so just being like swept up in a story the way that, that like, uh, a lay person would be, it becomes harder and, and it makes you more, and then you're also like affected by your, you know, your personal relationships to the people who've made the films and everything. And you, by, by this time, you kind of know most of the people who've made everything and some of them you really like and some of them you can't stand. And, and like, you know, the people who are really annoying are just like, oh God, I know that thing's probably really good, but I just really don't want to watch it or whatever. But, um, and um, yeah, I think it's, it probably like limits, I, I probably like, fewer thing to watch fewer things than I would if I were not, you know, working, uh, you know, hadn't made my life working in, in the film industry. But, um, but on the other hand, like when you see like something, I might appreciate something in a performance or something that most people might, or that a lot of people might not really think twice about or be that interested in I could think like god what he just did there is so hard and it's so brilliant and it's so like and it might be just a tiny little moment a little reaction or something that might go unnoticed but I, I just because of my personal experience and understanding the way you know what he had to do to kind of make that look so natural and and unconscious uh i could appreciate that kind of thing in a way that maybe like uh, somebody who does isn't an actor couldn't um so yeah it works both ways but yeah it does take some of the innocence away we're gonna leave it there with the innocence gone uh <laughs> alessandro Nivola, you're a great american thanks for joining us <laughs> Ben, this was man. so fun. Uh, listen, Come on again. This is this is. I uh, want more stories so about long... weird artwork. <laughs> <laughs> there are plenty more. There are plenty more. Um, ben, I wish I could see more of you in the flesh, but we'll have to we'll have to arrange that. When are you coming to New York? You know, whenever COVID ends. Um, All right. Well, you know, whenever let me we're. Know, will you? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, um, hey, I have to give oh, a plug. Oh, also, you live in plug. my neighborhood. That was the other thing I was going to say. What you live here? Yeah, well, I not currently, but I, I escaped. But yes, I live in Broom Hill, so. Oh my God! You know, I know. We, gotta, we, we, we have a. Well, I'll go to Rucola with Ethan Hawke. Rucola drink. Well, that's <laughs> What's I'm, the that's plug? Where I'm my, that's where I'm taking my brother this evening for his birthday. Oh, Give nice. Adrian my best. I will. I will. Oh, so what's the plug? Uh, so the quick plug is uh, Monday on FX is my, my next thing, which is a. a a new adaptation of Rumor Garden's novel, Black Narcissus, which was uh, an absolutely brilliant, like seminal movie, Powell and Pressburger movie from the 40s. 
um, which hopefully, you know, we're not like, you know, defiling the legacy of, but um, it, there are a bunch of incredible actors and a, a wonderful director. It's a three hour miniseries for FX. It airs Monday night lot on FX channel, all three episodes back to back. And then, uh, um, and then it, uh, it's going to stream on Hulu after that indefinitely. And it's, um, you know, I play the, the, it, you know, uh, Gemma Arterton plays the Deborah Carr role and I play the, the, uh, David Farrar role, Miss, Mr. Dean and, um, check it out. Excellent. Awesome. We will do that. Uh, Kay, Kay, all who, right. do, who do we have for tomorrow? I don't think we know. Do we, we know? know? I don't we'll think we know. Tomorrow. <laughs> we'll It'll be one of those <laughs> those surprise situations. Uh, Kate, let me know when you're back in town, and I will tell me when you tell me when you're coming up here. Excellent. That would be fun. You See would you love soon, Rukla, man. Ben. Stay healthy. Take Bye. Thank you for coming, Ben. You would love Rukla. It's like our favorite. It's it's like the restaurant of the neighborhood. It's like the place. I'm Amazing. I'm excited about it. Yeah. All this will begin. 22 hours and 45 minutes from now after promising Sandro we wouldn't go over today because he's got to meet Adrian, but uh, we went over. Uh, until then, we don't have fun anymore, but some of us have like Saul Steinberg drawings on, on our wall in back of us, and some of us have this. See you tomorrow. <laughs>